Welcome and congratulations on entering the inner circle of senior living. The Inner Circle discusses relevant topics in senior living investment, operations, financing, and beyond to drive the industry to the next level. With a continually changing environment, let's start the collaboration now. And welcome to another episode of The Inner Circle of Senior Living. I'm your host, Scott McCorvey. Super excited about this episode. Can't wait to share this with you. Before we get going, let's start with a quote from Albert Einstein. He said, strive not to be a success, but rather to be a value. And that's what senior living is all about. It's not about throwing up a huge community with all these crazy amenities in there. It's about creating value to the resident, about having that upgraded resident experience, that upgraded quality of life. And that starts with the care and the experience and the activities for that senior living resident. If this is your first time, welcome to the inner circle of senior living. I'm grateful to share over 15 years specifically in senior living investment experience to help our industry grow over the next five to 10 years. We're going to experience so much growth. So it's amazing to have you with us here in the inner circle. If you're coming back, welcome back. I definitely appreciate everyone that has shared these shows with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't, please do it. It's really easy to do. Simply right now, just share this with one or two people, colleagues, team members, vendors, clients, anyone you think could benefit from this information. From your apps, just click on the three dots. It'll have a share this episode function. Click on that. It'll bring up your contacts. Text this, email this, however you want to do this. Get this in front of a few people right now. If this is your first time to the Inner Circle, welcome. So excited that you found this platform. This show is all about helping each other as we grow together. But you're going to want to subscribe. It's free to do, but hit that subscribe button. That way you're guaranteed to get all the amazing content automatically pushed to you whenever it's released. And I've got some amazing shows in the works. So be sure to subscribe to get all the shows as they're released. Now, I'm super excited to share this episode with you. This episode is about NIC, or NIC, also known as the National Investment Center of Senior Housing and Care. This is such an amazing organization. From Nick Mapp to some legendary networking conferences, NIC is definitely continually working on enhancing our senior living industry. So I'm super excited to have Ryan Jeruko, CEO of NIC, joining us to discuss some of the amazing initiatives currently going on at NIC. But before we get into the discussion with Brian, I am happy to announce that this episode is sponsored by Senior Living Growth Advisors. If you're new to senior living or need help to maximize your growth potential, you'll need to partner with someone experienced like the group at Senior Living Growth Advisors. The principals have over 15 years of experience specifically, this is very important, specifically in senior living real estate investment. There's not many in the industry that have this type of experience. And in senior living experience, experience definitely matters and can really make or break your deal. Since senior living is unlike any other real estate segment, you need to partner with someone that has many senior living deals under their belts and understands the operations for a successful senior living project. I've seen some home run deals completely fail post-closing and I've seen some trouble deals wildly succeed and it all comes down to properly vetting, underwriting, and structuring the deal, having the right operator partner, and implementing some value-enhancing improvements. So whether it's new senior living acquisitions, new development, potential development, investment underwriting, capital sourcing, operator selection, document negotiation, deal structuring, site selection, market selection, asset management, and so much more, be sure you partner with someone that understands this specialized real estate segment. Be sure to visit the website www dot srgrowth.com that's www.srgrowth.com to learn more i also have a link in the show notes if you're enjoying these shows interested in a sponsorship opportunity or have a specific show idea be sure to reach out to me the best way to do that is through email it's scott s-c-o-t-t at srgrowth.com. That's scott at srgrowth.com. Shoot me an email. Let's set up an introduction call. Let me know if you're enjoying these shows, have a topic, or like to get more involved with the show. Now to discuss NIC's impact to senior living, super excited to have Brian Jerudko, CEO of NIC, joining us here on The Inner Circle. 
As NIC's president, Brian oversees overall strategy, volunteer leadership governance, and is accountable for the organizational performance, culture, and mission delivery. Prior to joining NIC, Brian served as Senior Vice President, Telecom, and GM for Comscore's Wireless Operator Analytics Division. A former nuclear submarine officer, Brian brings over two decades of leadership experience with a successful track record in analytics, business development, operational management, and data system development, and managed the company's first product partnership in addition to overseeing various strategic partnerships. In this episode, Brian and I discuss the history and evolution of the NIC organization. We also discuss Nick's response to COVID-19 and how Nick is prepared to help groups during this tremendous amount of industry expansion. Also, we discuss the format and benefits of the upcoming virtual fall experience. Be sure to check out and register for that fall experience in several of their industry enhancing initiatives. So much more. Guys, this is a great episode. I can't wait to share this with you. I think you're going to get a lot of amazing information from this episode. Be sure to share this with one or two people or just post a link in your LinkedIn. Guys, let's get into it. Without further ado, here is Brian Jarutko, president of NIC. Brian, thanks so much for joining us here in the inner circle of senior living. When I first entered the senior living industry in 2003, I immediately learned about Nick and later had the chance to attend many of your legendary networking conferences. But for those listeners that may be unfamiliar to Nick or abbreviation for the National Investment Center for Seniors Housing and Care, or they may be new to the industry and just learning about the association, do you mind giving a brief overview of yourself, the Nick organization, and how you first got involved with Nick? Absolutely. And Scott, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, to talk a bit about, let's talk about NIC first. Uh, So NIC is an organization, we're actually a 501c3 uh, not-for-profit. And our mission is to enable access and choice for America's elders. And the means by which we do that is we provide data, analytics, and connections. And so the thought process behind the organization is that if we provide this platform for connecting capital seekers, capital providers, other service providers in the seniors housing and skilled nursing space, uh, by providing that efficient platform for transactions, for partnerships to occur, ultimately Mm -hmm. America's elders will benefit because it's an opportunity for innovation, for sharing of knowledge, and quite frankly, competition uh, in providing capital and or receiving capital uh, in the marketplace. Now, the organization itself uh, if you look at it uh, in, in aggregate, it uh, really has kind of three component parts. Uh, one, of course, is connections, which is the uh, which are the events. We have the spring conference, typically in the March time frame, and we also have a fall conference uh, occurring typically in the September October time frame. And uh, we like to think of those as kind of you know must attend conferences uh, mm-hmm. where the who's who of seniors housing and skilled nursing. Uh, typically will attend both on the capital side and the operator side as, uh, as well as service providers and many of the uh, additional partners that help facilitate transactions themselves. And uh, so that's kind of the, the connections organization. Uh, we also, of course, have our data organization, uh, which is NICMAP. And NICMAP uh, really was uh, or is, I would say, the kind of the gold standard uh, for data in the seniors housing and skilled nursing space, particularly when you're looking at uh, at supply side data. Yeah. If you're looking at uh, the properties that are in a particular market, uh, their occupancies, uh, market rates. So uh, we collect that information from the operators themselves. Uh, and then we provide that back out in a way that it protects the confidentialities of the operators and properties that provide the information, but provide enough information that um, that allows benchmarking of a particular mm-hmm. geography and a particular uh, care segment. Right. Now, I joined the organization back in 2015, and uh, I've uh, been, so been with the organization now for five, coming up on, uh, on six years. And, you know, one of the, uh, the things that really intrigued me about the organization itself is uh, from a brand perspective, it's incredibly strong. From a mission right. perspective, uh, ultimately, if NIC does its job well, millions of America's elders will benefit uh, by having additional access and additional choice in the seniors housing space. So when I first joined, uh, I joined as president, 
and uh, had the opportunity to oversee uh, really some of the, the data products, our Nick Map product. Mm -hmm. Over time in 2017, I took over as CEO uh, with the opportunity to look at it from a more strategic perspective and also expand uh, kind of ownership for, um, in addition to the strategic component, uh, other products and services. That's great. And, and yeah, Nick is doing a lot of great things. So definitely appreciate you and, and Nick and all the resources and help that they've done and really help evolve our industry over the last 30 years. Brian, I find many of us share the same passion for senior living as it's way more than just real estate. It's actually making a real impact on residents, families, and overall communities. Do you remember when you first discovered your passion for this industry? And how has that changed through the years? Yeah, that's a, a great question because one of the things you certainly see in the, in the space is passion. And I think the, the reason for that is because ultimately what the industry does is it helps care for uh, our parents, our grandparents, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, likely many of us in the future as well. And so uh, there's so many times where I've, I've heard personal stories where someone has said uh, the reason I got into the space was because um, I was looking for a solution for my mother and my father, right. and uh, when I looked at the options, I found that nothing really fit what I thought uh, would be appropriate, mm -hmm. and so I started my own property, and here I am, you know, 20 properties, 30 properties later. Uh, and so there's certainly a lot of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit and the true passion for helping older Americans. I was first tangentially exposed uh, more to skilled nursing at first when my grandfather uh, had an experience and uh, I uh, flew out to visit my parents uh, as they were contemplating the options that were uh, available to my grandfather. And quite frankly, you know, as an uninitiated person uh, in the seniors housing and skilled nursing space, it's somewhat bewilder bewildering. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I was also exposed to a memory care facility via another older member of the family. Uh, and this was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, and out of the blue, I was contacted in 2015 by a recruiter uh, who, uh, who provided me with the opportunity to interview for the uh, NIC role. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, you know, I, uh, I was certainly intrigued again by the, by the mission piece, uh, was absolutely intrigued by NIC's strong brand and presence in the space uh, and the broader kind of demographic trends. But my real exposure to the passion that is in this space was when I was interviewing with the volunteer leaders for NIC, and I had the opportunity mm -hmm. of interviewing in two different cities, uh, one in Chicago and one in New York, mm -hmm. and, uh, and hearing those personal stories uh, of why they're involved in the space and why they're involved in NIC. And uh, it was really clear to me that there was true passion for helping the organization uh, and helping, you know, the uh, the sector overall via the organization uh, because there is again this recognition that if if the organization does well if what they uh, if their businesses do well they are helping uh, millions of America's elders and at the same time doing well for themselves uh, they're not mutually exclusive by any means and so uh, as I've had more of those interactions uh, with many of our volunteer leaders as well as others in the space. I certainly have seen that uh, I think we're very fortunate to be in a sector where in general uh, I would say there is a, uh, a very open and uh, generally caring culture, uh, not just uh, for the residents uh, but for the staff uh, yes. and then even the willingness to help others out in, uh, in times yes. of need. Yeah, it's amazing how much passion is within our industry. Uh, and you can see that just going to any NIC conference or any industry conference. It's unlike any other real estate conference that I've been to. And I think a lot of that is due to the extreme passion that a lot of our partners and industry uh, colleagues share. And that passion truly comes through in a lot of these conferences when we start talking about our industry. Uh, so it's amazing to see. So I appreciate you sharing that. Now, Senior Living is a relatively new product, but it has grown and matured so much much over the past 30 to 40 years. And Nick has experienced a lot of growth too. It seems like every fall conference, it's announced that there's a new attendance record. However, I'm not sure how many of the listeners actually know about the history and evolution of NIC. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of Nick when it was first created and how it has evolved through the years? So NIC was actually started as the National Investment Conference uh, for Seniors Housing and Care back in 1991. 
uh, by Bob Kramer and some of his co-founders then. And it was started off with the idea that let's have a one-day conference mm-hmm. where the principals, the C-suite really, of operating companies of seniors housing, uh, as well as those potential investors in the seniors housing space would get together, uh, have some educational content, have the opportunity to meet one another, uh, maybe have a drink or so in the evening, and at the end of the day, they, everyone goes home. Mm-hmm. And that was the, the first conference back in 1991. Uh, and the, again, the, the thought process behind it was that uh, at the time, seniors housing was a relatively small asset class, and the cost of capital was relatively high. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, the platform itself, it wasn't very efficient to find those that uh, provided capital in the space. And conversely, if you're looking for capital in the space, you know, how, do you, how do you find those that are uh, providing capital? Or if you're providing capital, how do you find those that are seeking capital? And so this was a focal point to get people together, uh, to allow them to meet one another, to have uh, those conversations so you can figure out whether or not there's a fit and you could uh, you know, follow up at a subsequent point. And so uh, over time, that, uh, that conference continued to grow. And, uh, and it was in around uh, early 2000s, actually 2004, uh, when we also identified the need for transparency in the space through data, uh, which mm-hmm. led to the Nick Map product, which was launched in 2004. And this was really, you know, if, if one looks at the large institutional investors and others out there that are investing in uh, various asset classes, one of the most important pieces they need is they need data in order to understand the risk profile of a particular segment. And again, in the seniors housing space, which is relatively small to others, that there was no data. Mm-hmm. And through the power of uh, many of the volunteer leaders uh, of, uh, of NIC, uh, they went around and uh, really took up a, uh, a seed fund to start Nick Map uh, back in 2004, which covered about 31 or so metro areas at the time. And, uh, and that information was really the first to view uh, in aggregate as to here are trends in occupancy, here are trends in, uh, in construction, in market rates, and so on and so forth. But that started setting kind of the benchmark and the track record to understand, gosh, what, is, what does this space look like? And again, mm-hmm. if you're a capital allocator, to start understanding how does this space compare to others. And I think as we went through particularly the, the GFC, there was this understanding that seniors housing is a needs-based, uh, in many instances, as a needs-based um, real estate asset class. Uh, mm-hmm. It performed fairly well relative to other real estate asset classes. Right. And uh, as a result, uh, capital continued to, uh, to view it fairly favorably. Uh, and so that was, again, in, in 2000, over time, NICMAP itself has continued to grow, uh, growing from 31 to 75 to 99 to, uh, I think we're at about 140 or so metro areas right now that we cover. Yeah. Um, you know, in addition to kind of the data itself, the next question is, okay, well, what does it mean? And that's where our analytics uh, segment really comes in, which is... Uh, uh, we brought Beth Mace on board, uh, who is the industry's first and only chief economist, uh, who takes a lot of the information provided by Nick Map, as well as other data sources, uh, and helps provide some insight into, well, what does this mean for the industry as a whole, right. uh, given the, many of the changes in the, in the market. And, uh, and that's been kind of our, our third, um, if you will, business unit uh, to understand the implications of, uh, of changes in the Nick Map data set, again, as well as, uh, as other data sets. Nick Map is an amazing resource. I've been fortunate to uh, be a user since its in- inception there in 2004. But that was such a huge upgrade or step up for our industry, especially for the capital providers. Other real estate classes had this more uniform institutional data and tools to utilize in making their investment decisions. However, senior living was still in its infancy and didn't quite have that. So having Nick Map really put a legitimacy into this real estate class, like the other food groups of multifamily and commercial um, retail and office and things like that, Nick Map really made a huge overall impact to our industry and the capital providers. Um, that's all the total returns, but didn't have a uniform way to measure a lot of the statistics and data that they wanted to analyze, like the rent growth or the overall rents or the occupancy or absorption or new supply. A lot of those things Nick Map covers 
was was a big, huge resource and bump to our industry. So really appreciate that. And we'll have to do a separate show on, on Nick Map, but it's got a lot of great usability to it. And also, as you mentioned, just covering so many more MSAs uh, than when it first started. So it's a, it's a great resource. Um, definitely listeners, if you're not using that, uh, be sure to check that out. Now, Brian, clearly 2020 has been a year like any other um, due to COVID-19, and it's significantly impacted our industry in so many ways. What has Nick been focused on the past six months to really help our industry during these challenging times? Scott, before I answer the question as it pertains to COVID, just one other thought on NICMAP in particular. Yeah. I think one of the important things to recognize with NICMAP is you know, it is also a, um, just like NIC, the organization itself, is a reflection of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, NIC MAP is a reflection of the industry. Uh, it's really through the power of the industry providing data that the industry as a whole is able to tell its story, uh, with the thought process being that ultimately a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine the scenario where the story being told is uh, there's too much supply in this particular area. So um, you know, before you were to develop in that area, you may want to uh, make sure you do your you know appropriate amount of due diligence. And alternatively, mm -hmm. that may also help you identify opportunities in an area. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is through the power of uh, of the contributors and the operators themselves that provide the information uh, that the industry as a whole is able to tell their story and that investors and capital providers uh, are able to make uh, what I would say the appropriate decisions to either say, you know, there's an opportunity here or there's a risk here uh, in a particular space or a particular segment. Absolutely. Now, great point. It's, re it's really due to the participation of the providers that makes the data so legitimate and strong. That's right. And uh, it really is unique from that perspective. Uh, now, as it pertains to your, your question on, on COVID and uh, the impact it's had, you know, what has Nick been doing for the past six months? I think one of the, the key pieces over the course of the past six months and continuing on the theme of data and transparency uh, really has been that point. Uh, this is a time of rapid, rapid change. Mm -hmm. uh, as I had uh, one board member say, uh, in this time, a day is like a week, a week is like a month, and a month is like <laughs> a year. Right. And uh, if you can imagine just the, the, the tremendous amount of change that we've seen, uh, it's amazing to even think right now that the, the last time I traveled, I was coming back from our spring conference, uh, that was March 6th, right. and uh, I, it's, it's, that's almost unimaginable at this point. In so long. Uh, and I, you know, it, it really is. And, and so I, I, I look forward to uh, getting back to uh, meeting folks in person. Uh, but until that time, uh, it really has been around providing data and, uh, and transparency. And we've done that through a couple of, uh, a couple of different initiatives. One of the first initiatives going back to the NICMAP data product is that the NICMAP data product uh, has been, you know, since 2004 has really been quarterly deliverables. And so we would provide the information out uh, at the end of each quarter. So the first quarter data this year was scheduled to come out in uh, late April, early May. Uh, we would publish that information. The next time that data would be published would be second quarter data uh, ending, of course, in, uh, in June and, you know, let's say, late July. Uh, and one of the things we realized very soon was that's just too long. And mm -hmm. we knew from a strategic perspective, we wanted to speed up the pace of delivery to allow operators and investors more insight into the, into the space and particularly these rapid changes. Mm -hmm. And so we changed our product roadmap to say this is our A number one priority on Nick Map to go ahead and speed up this deliverable. And, and we did that. Uh, you know, starting with uh, data ending April uh, and then data ending May delivered the, the subsequent month. And that was important uh, because, again, uh, so many uh, constituents in the space are looking to NICMAP to understand the benchmarks. Uh, and, you know, what's re really interesting, even now you see a large of the public, uh, a lot of the public REITs, uh, in some cases doing uh, almost uh, when they do reporting, they show information on a weekly basis. Uh, and that transparency is incredibly helpful as the industry as a whole just grapples to understand the implications of this uh, hopefully once in a only once in a lifetime uh, right. type of uh, type of event. 
And so the, the NIC map piece was important, and we're moving as many data sets as we can to that more frequent and deliverable cycle uh, to provide, again, that, that education and that uh, transparency for both investors and operators in the space. Along those lines, uh, another important piece has just been knowledge sharing, uh, the ability to get together with either your peers or experts in the space to understand how they're interpreting uh, some of the, the changes. And so on one front, we, were, uh, we did leadership huddles. And so leadership mm -hmm. huddles were typically every other week uh, and typically hosted by, uh, by Beth Mace or someone from our outreach team. Uh, to talk about you know, some of the important trends in the space. Early on, it was looking at some of the capital trends and what's going on with debt. Uh, over time, it's also been looking at um, some trends in testing and how, for example, the NBA has been approaching uh, their uh, bubble concept and you know, were there any lessons learned that could be applicable to seniors housing and skilled nursing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, those have been uh, fairly well attended. And I think, uh, again, the thought process over there is let's, let's help share information at a time when things are, are rapidly changing. Yes. We also hosted a, uh, what we call a, a brain date platform uh, early on in the, in the pandemic. And the brain date platform was a concept that we had debuted at our spring conference uh, but it's really user-generated topics uh, mm -hmm. that allow others to opt into a conversation based on that topic. So we provide the platform and kind of that focal point uh, for those connections to occur. Yes. And a user can go in there and sign up and, uh, and post a topic. The topic might be something like uh, best practices in mm -hmm. um, sourcing PPE. Mm -hmm. And uh, other uh, potential participants could go ahead and uh, visit the Brain Date platform, uh, identify that as a topic they're interested in, and see when the originator had scheduled that conversation. And if they're interested, they can join. And those conversations are either set up as one-on-one -on -one conversations or a group of five. And when that uh, time comes, the, uh, the platform, the Brain Date platform, provides a video conference platform for that group to get together uh, for either a 30-minute or 45-minute conversation to share information. And so it's both a platform for sharing information and, of course, connections. Uh, so I think that was another important component. Uh, we've also uh, really taken to heart um, you know, kind of a, a putting data into context. And what I mean by that, uh, we have kind of a, a three-phased approach uh, looking at uh, COVID data. Uh, phase one is really putting public data into context. So a lot of the data that's out there uh, is what I would uh, call numerator information. Uh, and so that numerator information is information about a, um, uh, the, the total number of cases or the total number of deaths or what's occurring in one community. But it's hard for that data to be put into context uh, because a lot of that context is not publicly available. In other words, uh, if you have the information on one community and to understand uh, how many uh, cases there are in that one community and how many beds are in that one community, uh, that could be one story. However, if you put that into the broader context of the entire industry, uh, it's mm -hmm. important to just understand what that means for the entire industry because a lot of the headlines, uh, of course, are about the, that one instance rather than putting into context. Right. And so uh, we, uh, we put out a COVID reach tracker um, putting or taking information from publicly available state data and putting it into the context of NIC map data to say, well, you know, here's a... Uh, here's an understanding as to what reach of COVID looks like amongst all communities rather than you know, these particular communities. Mm -hmm. uh, we also, to the extent possible, tried uh, and are continuing to try to educate, uh, I would say, the, the broader space uh, outside of seniors housing and skilled nursing as to some of the nuances associated with care settings. Uh, and so again, from the outside looking in, and even from my early experiences, you know, understanding the difference between skilled nursing, assisted living, independent living, memory care, yeah. um, that's, that's not common knowledge to right. um, you know, the, the general public and in mm -hmm. many instances to the general media as well. And so uh, we also had a kind of, you know, our phase two of, uh, of COVID data uh, analysis was generating uh, incremental data to what's available in the public. And uh, we were fortunate again to have the support of uh, many operators as we looked out to, to survey. 
and uh, provide information as to you know what's the test positivity rate uh, as well as uh, the number of cases uh, as a percentage of residents differentiated by IL, AL, memory care, and uh, skilled nursing, which again is something that uh, you know as the the general media talks about uh, COVID, it's typically associated with the skilled nursing data set. Although mm-hmm. some states are reporting assisted living in addition to uh, skilled nursing, but it's really hard to get information on independent living or to break mm-hmm. out memory care, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that was another important piece because you know, what we've heard over and over again is, gosh, we need data to help ground our decisions because absent that data, we're going to pull back um, so that we have some clarity before making any new bets, if you will, or new investments. Uh, and so that was, uh, you know, that's the, the phase two piece, and we've been doing uh, either weekly or every other week surveys looking at statistics uh, associated with uh, COVID amongst the various care segments, uh, as well as tracking some of the changes in, um, in occupancy. Uh, the most recent uh, iteration uh, has actually been looking at the skilled nursing data that is being collected uh, and released by um, by CMS uh, via the CDC site, mm-hmm. and uh, that information we have actually uh, uploaded into um, you know, a graphic user, uh, user interface uh, using Tableau uh, and made it available on our website uh, in a way that's just a little bit more user friendly and easier to look at trends of new cases uh, either per resident or per property. And one of the things that's also collected in that data set is actually weekly skilled nursing um, census, uh, which is another thing that's trended over time. And, you know, it's an important piece for um, to put the data sets in context and to provide transparency. Uh, and then the, one of the, the, the final initiatives I'll just talk about here is uh, we've also recently announced uh, an RFP to understand the incremental impact uh, that COVID has had on older Americans by care setting. And so this, again, is to look at uh, what's the incremental impact um, that COVID has had for older Americans uh, by IL, AL, memory care, skilled nursing, uh, relative to what we would say traditional residential. So in a non-congregate setting, whether those are senior apartments uh, or a traditional single-family home, uh, the the desire here is to you know is ultimately to understand the impact that COVID has had by those care settings and specifically the incremental impact whether that's yeah. death whether that's delirium uh, mm-hmm. depression uh, those are all metrics that we would like to be able to get to, get to and so we've uh, put that out to the broader academic community and uh, and various consultants and are looking for those proposals to come back so that we can award a grant to do that study. And I think the important piece here is to put that study into context about what was known about the virus uh, at Mm -hmm. the time, as well as context of uh, what are the broader conditions in the market where that community is located. I think we've certainly seen a lot of reports, particularly on the skilled nursing side, uh, and analyses that have been done by uh, very respected organizations like Brown University, that show one of the huge indicators of whether or not there's COVID in skilled nursing uh, is the uh, really the reach of COVID in the broader community, i.e. the, the general community, not the, the property itself, uh, because, of course, workers have to go home and come back. And uh, with asymptomatic spread and testing and or screening, uh, it, uh, in the early days in particular, uh, it was challenging and to keep uh, the virus out of, uh, out of communities. Over time, as we have become smarter about uh, or have had more availability of testing and or PPE and or social norms have changed to wearing masks uh, or we're in a different phase of opening, those are all important uh, factors that should be better understood uh, to see what their impact is on, uh, on again, on older Americans. And so it's a, I think it's an ambitious study, but an important one to uh, to really understand the uh, the impact that COVID has had, and again, put it all in the context about what was known about the virus at the time. 
Yes, I love how Nick quickly jumped in there uh, to really provide as much assistance as possible with the industry and helping navigate the challenging COVID pandemic. It seems like almost immediately I was receiving uh, your COVID impact surveys uh, and then having those on a consistent basis just really provided a lot more transparency uh, for people that were trying to uh, go through these unprecedented times. So that's really been amazing. I also just love how Nick embraces collaboration, innovation, and really sharing industry data to provide that transparency that we talked about. Having that transparency really puts the industry, enhances the overall industry, so it's not seen as more of a um, kind of cloudy or vague uh, as far as a lot of the different metrics that people look at. Another great point that you mentioned is, especially right now during COVID, is the general public a lot of times are mixing together long-term care and senior living. So we're hearing a lot of news stories about long-term care, unfortunately, in some of the COVID cases that have spread through some of those facilities. And people a lot of times associate that with assisted living and independent living, which just isn't the case. I've heard so many different communities have zero cases reported of COVID. However, a lot of the people in the news hear about a lot of cases in long-term care and assume that's also happening in assisted living living and independent living. So having these surveys, and, and, and as you mentioned, having the links to a lot more of the actual state reported cases, I think is huge in trying to rebrand and enhance our industry during and post COVID times, because I think that's so key. I've talked about this with a lot of people, but the demand for senior living has not changed in the past six months. What's changed is the number of move-ins. So we have to recreate the mentality of the general public that it's safe. In fact, you can even make an argument that it's safer than a resident living in their own home and being exposed to grocery shopping and other uh, sources that aren't as protected as a senior living community. Uh, so great points there, Brian. Appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. And, and again, I would say that, uh, you know, a continuation of the trend here, which is it is really through the participation of the industry. NIC is mm -hmm. a reflection of the industry and its support. And without yeah. the industry supporting these surveys, uh, being able to tell that story of the differentiation between care segments uh, is something that is that we're unable to do. Uh, but I think we are the right organization to do that. Uh, and that information, you know, the media just doesn't have access to that information because it doesn't exist. Uh, and so we are the organization to help tell that story in a way that really uh, compares across those care settings and hopefully helps educate uh, you know, different constituents over time. And we talked about several of the initiatives that you're currently working on or you have worked on in the past and looking to work on in the future, but you hold some legendary industry networking conferences. If a listener has not experienced a fall, Nick, you definitely need to do that. Um, and I'll do a separate episode, so a separate episode on how to best prepare for that, but you'll need to plan uh, weeks ahead of time because people's schedule gets lined up. But it's an amazing event, definitely something that you need to attend. However, due to COVID-19 and social distancing, I know NIC unfortunately had to change the fall 2020 fall conference from an in-person conference to a virtual conference, which totally understand. However, some listeners not, might not be aware of some of the benefits and advantages of attending a virtual conference. Brian, do you mind explaining a little bit about some of the lineup and some of the things you have planned for the upcoming virtual conference, which is October 6th through 8th and also October 13th through 15th? Absolutely. And, and thank you uh, for, for the opportunity. So the, the way I would think about the fall conference, it's actually part of uh, a broader, what we would call the uh, 2020 NIC fall experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing we realized early on was that move, you, you can't just take you know, the schedule of an in-person conference uh, and move it online. Right? You can't just take the two and a half day event uh, where everyone's co-located in the same place and move it online. You have to take a step back and almost deconstruct the purpose of the event to then figure out how to meet those same objectives in a virtual world. And in speaking to our constituents, we really saw there were three key, poor, uh, three key purposes to the event, or reasons why uh, attendees attended the event. Number one, it was to maintain existing relationships and build new relationships. Uh, to your point, it is the opportunity to have 30 to 40 meetings over two and a half days. Uh, at the end of that time period, you know, really to have a good sense as to with whom you'll be following up. Uh, mm -hmm. The second piece is around getting a pulse on the industry. Through those 30 and 40 meetings and through the educational sessions and running into people in the hall, at the end of an NIC event, you have a really good sense that say, you know what, here are the major trends. 
And so those major trends might be there's too much capital or there's too much construction or you know, whatever those major trends are at the end of an NIC event, you'll, you'll have a good sense as to what they are. Mm -hmm. And the third big piece, of course, is education. And so as we looked to help deliver on those, one of the things we realized is maintaining existing relationships, while there's certainly an opportunity there, that's something in a virtual world. Uh, if you have someone's contact information, you can reach out to them. Uh, and so while as a platform we're able to help with that, one of the key things we're really focusing on is helping build those new relationships. Uh, and so as we look at the fall experience, uh, it's comprised of three key pieces. One, of course, is Education Week, which is the 6th to the 8th of October. Uh, and these will be, uh, you know, at a traditional conference, we'd have about 17 or so sessions. Uh, we're actually going to have about 30 sessions during Education oh, wow. Week. And the reason it's almost double is because in an in-person uh, meeting, those sessions can be anywhere from 60 to 75 minutes. That attention span just doesn't exist in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. And so what, we're, uh, what we've done is we've really – um, broken them into either 30 or 45 minute, and in rare cases, 60 minute sessions uh, to help keep the attention of, uh, of uh, participants. Uh, and so we'll have more sessions, uh, but they'll be more focused. Now, during those sessions, the platform itself will allow uh, participants to reach out to others that are on the platform, either in those sessions or on the virtual platform at the same time. Uh, you can actually see who the other participants are at the time. You can reach out to them and say, hey, after this session, let's catch up. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you, or you know, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, and so that's the, the education week. Uh, and then we have the connections week, which is the following week. Uh, and you know, both the education and connection week uh, typically will go from about noon Eastern till about 5 or 6. Uh, and that's to accommodate uh, participants both on the East Coast and the West Coast. It's, uh, so many uh, participants will be in different time zones. During Connections Week, uh, we'll have the opportunity to interact really through two key ways. Uh, one is through the Brain Date platform, which we talked about earlier. So think of user-generated topics that are um, put up on a, uh, on a marketplace. And other participants can look at those topics and say, yeah, you know, I'd really like to talk to um, Scott about – uh, trends in the senior living space. And it uh, looks like this is a group discussion, and I'd like to meet some of these other folks as well. So yeah, I will sign up for this date and time and join the conversation. Uh, the other piece over here uh, is going to be peer-to-peer uh, -peer discussions or peer-to-peer -peer learnings. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to be using the Zoom breakout room functionality. And these will be moderated discussions where initially you know, we'll have X number of attendees. Uh, we can have anywhere up to 300 attendees on these uh, where they will initially join a large Zoom room, uh, and uh, we'll have a moderator, whether that's Beth Mace or Bob Kramer or someone from the outreach team, uh, who will kick off the topic. And uh, after about five or ten minutes of background, the group will be given a prompt. And that prompt may be something like, you know, what's the most important piece of data that's necessary for uh, lenders to uh, begin to feel more comfortable um, financing new construction? And uh, those groups will then be, uh, that large group will be broken into groups of about six to eight people. Uh, they'll have about eight to ten minutes or so uh, to answer that prompt and introduce themselves to other people. And uh, these groups will be formed at, at random. Uh, and then those groups will be forced back into a large group, and this all ha happens automatically. Mm. And, uh, and when they're back in the, the main group, uh, the moderator will call on one or two of those groups to share their information. Then provide another prompt, and uh, everyone will be broken out into a different group of, uh, of people and have the opportunity to meet them and share information, then brought back to the main group. And we'll do that two to three times. Uh, and so that's an opportunity, again, to meet people uh, as well as learn from others. Uh, yes. And then finally, the, the last piece we have is a platform we're building, which is called uh, excuse me, Nick Community Connector. And so Nick Community Connector, uh, think of it as um, a 24-7, 365 platform and directory of uh, active Nick constituents. So these, uh, right now, the only way to get access to the Nick Community Connector is to sign up for the fall conference, and it comes with that. But you'll have access to the platform uh, from the 9th of September uh, all the way through to the end of the year uh, as part of uh, attending the, the fall conference. So we'll ask a series of questions up front to get information. If you're an operator, for example, how many properties do you have? Where are they located? What kind of capital and services are you looking for? If you're a capital provider, 
uh, what kind of capital do you provide, uh, what size, you know, do you specialize in any particular geography or properties. Uh, if you are a service provider, we will ask the same information. And then uh, the directory itself will allow you to filter on all those responses to identify those folks that are interested in your services and or products. Uh, and so that allows that communication to occur, and you would send a message via the platform, the other person would receive it, and you can respond back. Um, but again, this is something where we've realized in the virtual world, you know, to some extent we're competing with life, right? Mm -hmm. You sign up for yeah. something, and then all of a sudden your dog starts barking, uh, or a, a, a work call comes up uh, with an important yeah. client. Uh, you may take that. So we'll record the educational sessions, but this connections platform, the Nick Community Connector, will be available. Uh, again, 24-7 asynchronous communication. Over time, we'll add features like a news or community feature just like you'd have on Facebook or LinkedIn or other social media platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll also use the information to help curate some connections as well. And so we really intend this to be something that uh, lives beyond uh, this virtual time. And so even in, I'm going to say, normal times or new normal times, uh, and when we do go back to events, um, this will be a platform to allow you to connect with people on an ongoing basis. So if you're new to the space or if you're, you're there and the, they've uh, been in the space for a while and want to meet new people, it's a wonderful way uh, to go ahead and look at those that are active in the space. Not those that were there three years ago and have changed their mind, uh, but mm -hmm. those that are currently kind of Nick constituents. So that's the thought process behind this broader fall experience. You know, how do you accomplish a lot of the same objectives but differently? Uh, yes. And so we realize that the fall conference um, you know, it's not a lesser version of an in-person event. It's just a different way of delivering on those objectives. And you know, there's a lot in there for what we would say would be, uh, you know, kind of the um, the attendance for the uh, the fall virtual experience. Uh, but I, you know, I kind of equate it to Netflix, right? There's there's something for everyone, but you don't have to participate in everything in order to get value out of it. No, I love so much how NIC is embracing technology to really make this as interactive as possible. So listeners that are typically going to NIC as in just a chance to network and, and, and reconnect or connect with a lot of new folks in the industry, definitely use this as an opportunity to really learn and grow and to utilize a lot of these technologies to make new contacts virtually. I really love how that's happening in this fall experience. And this, you mentioned this is a, a different time, and I always look at different times as a way to grow and to challenge myself. So I know some communities are using this time to really revamp their website or work on CapEx projects. I know some are even documenting the stories from the different residents. However, as a um, person in the industry, you can also use this time to really learn more about the senior living industry. So a lot of these virtual sessions are a way to really grow, refine, and learn more about senior living and a chance that you wouldn't otherwise have to do. So really, really love that. Um, definitely check out that fall experience. It sounds like there's some really exciting functionality to it. And it's not just sitting there looking at a video of someone talking for two hours. Brian, as you mentioned, there's a lot of shorter sessions, a lot more interactivity, using Zoom, meeting new people. There's a lot of great opportunities there. So appreciate you sharing that because I wasn't as aware of a lot of the things that you're planning and doing as well. I'm sure the listeners are in the same boat. Brian, senior living, we're going to experience so much growth in the next five to 10 years. That's inevitable. That is one of the reasons why I wanted to create this platform. But Brian, how is NIC prepared to assist groups during this expansion cycle? And how can we help ensure our industry maintains top quality of care with so many groups entering the space? That's a, that's a great question. You're right. There is going to be, I think, ongoing change uh, and growth. Um, there are certainly wonderful opportunities. And, uh, and particularly with this pandemic, uh, you know, things that will have to change. I think uh, a couple things. Number one, uh, I go back to this mantra, if you will, of data and transparency. Um, I think that's an important piece uh, in the broader story to say that uh, to help understand these changes and to put them in a context, to help understand what they mean uh, for investors uh, and for operators, uh, there has to be continued data and increased data and transparency on an ongoing basis. Uh, and Nick plays a key role in that uh, broader ecosystem. Uh, I also think education uh, is another important piece. Uh, and so education, both through peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, as well as through uh, analytics uh, that are done by, um, you know, like, like our outreach team, uh, Beth Mason and her team, to put that data into context and understand the implications. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I, I 
the, the connections piece is incredibly important. Uh, the opportunity to connect with others uh, because ultimately you, you, you can't do everything yourself. You have to partner with someone and over time mm -hmm. those partners may change, particularly in times of rapid change where yes. people's business yes. models change. Yes. And you have to find an efficient way to meet other folks. And so instead of doing a Google search uh, for that information, why not attend and or participate uh, with an organization whose very mission is around connecting people in the ecosystem so that ultimately yes. America's elders benefit uh, by having more options and choice in seniors housing and care. So true. And that's why I like to share best practices because I think the more that we can grow together and enhance each other, the better our industry will be. So instead of keeping any kind of secrets as kind of trade secrets, share them so our industry can grow together and we can all enhance each other because as the industry gets a better reputation, we all get a be better reputation. So I love that uh, NIC is part of that and sharing a lot of the best practices of the different operators, especially during these times as we start to reopen our communities and but still maintain safe practices it's really key to share a lot of what's working at communities so others can benefit from that as well brian i really appreciate you taking the time to join us here in the inner circle i could talk to you all day but i really appreciate you joining us if someone would like to learn more about nic or definitely the upcoming fall experience what's the best way for them to do that the easiest way and the best way to do it is just visit our website, which is nic.org, so nic.org, and uh, you'll see uh, information on the fall experience and registration. And we certainly hope uh, hope there's an opportunity to meet some of the of your constituents uh, at the NIC fall experience. Sounds great. And I'll have a link in the show notes, so be sure to click on that uh, to get the latest and learn more about the fall experience. Brian, thanks so much. I appreciate you joining the Inner Circle. Look forward to connecting with you again here shortly. Scott, thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate your time and interest. All right, that's it for this one. A big thank you and shout out to Brian for joining us here in the Inner Circle. I could talk about senior living with him all day, but so glad that he have joined us for this discussion. We'll have to have follow-up conversations with NIC because they're working on so many great initiatives impacting our senior living industry. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe as I've got some amazing content that's going to be released here shortly. The best way and the only way to really get that content as it's released is to subscribe to this show. Also, shoot this to one or two of your colleagues, your industry relationships, anyone you feel could benefit from this information. Guys, this platform has grown tremendously and it's all because of you sharing this show, sharing this message. So post it on your LinkedIn, shoot a link to a few people that you know, help them join the inner circle. They're going to be thankful that you brought this show to their attention. Also, a big thank you and shout out to our sponsor, Senior Living Growth Advisors. Whatever you need in the investment marketplace, work with someone that's experienced, guys. I stress this so much. Someone that's experienced in senior living real estate investment. The principals at Senior Living Growth Advisors do that specifically. Visit the website www.srgrowth.com. That's www.srgrowth.com with any of your questions or guidance on the senior living investment investment marketplace. Also, if you'd like to get more involved with the show or would like to learn more about sponsorship opportunities, shoot me an email at scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, at srgrowth.com. Love connecting with you. Let me know if I can help you. If you have a specific show idea or if you'd like to get more involved in the show or learn about potential sponsorship opportunities. All right, that's it for this one. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed this show. Again, thank you for Brian and NIC for joining us here on this episode. I've got some amazing shows that I can't wait to release. But until then, you know what time it is. That's right. It's time to go out there in our senior living industry and make a difference. We appreciate you participating in the inner circle of senior living. Now, it's your turn to help spread the message. Be sure to share your questions and comments with the inner circle community and discuss the different topics with your friends and colleagues. Until next time, thanks for joining the Inner Circle of Senior Living.